chapter twenty one of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay from williamsburg to fair oaks the evacuation of yorktown took general mcclellan so completely by surprise that a good deal of valuable time was lost in hurried preparation to pursue the retiring enemy franklin's division after their fortnight of delay on the transports had been disembarked they were hastily returned to their boats several hours were consumed in having the commands properly provisioned for the march the evacuation was discovered at dawn and it was noon before the first column started in pursuit johnston by this time had taken his entire command to williamsburg knowing that mcclellan's advance would soon reach him he made his dispositions at his leisure he posted a strong rear-guard there under longstreet to protect the movement of his trains the union cavalry under george stoneman came into collision with this force about dark and was repulsed losing one gun the main body of the pursuing army came up during the night under the command of general sumner heitzelman and keyes it is strongly illustrative of general mcclellan's relations with his corps commanders that neither of these generals had any orders from him as to the conduct of the battle which was inevitable as soon as they overtook the enemy and there was even serious doubt as to which among them was in command of the forces sumner had been ordered by the general-in-chief to take command in his absence but these orders had not been communicated to heitzelman who thought that he was to take control of the movement there was some confusion of orders as to the roads to be taken by the different commands in consequence of which hooker came into position on the left of the line and smith on the right the contrary disposition had been intended the morning of the fifth came with no definite plan of battle arranged general hooker following his own martial instincts moved forward and attacked the enemy at half-past seven and was soon hotly engaged he fought almost the entire rear-guard of johnston during the whole forenoon heavy reinforcements thrown against him checked his advance and caused him to lose the ground he had gained hooker speaks in his report with much bitterness not wholly unjustified of the manner in which his division was left to fight an overwhelming force unaided in the presence of more than thirty thousand of their comrades with arms in their hands and we search the reports of general mcclellan and the corps commanders in vain for any adequate explanation of this state of things later in the day hancock had a hard fight with greater success on the right the whole day was bloody and expensive and without adequate result the zeal of heitzelman the heroism of hooker and hancock and their brave troops were well nigh wasted there was no head no intelligent director no understood plan mcclellan arrived late in the day and was unable to contribute anything to the result although the cheers with which he was welcomed showed how fully he possessed the confidence and affection of his troops he had not anticipated so early an engagement and was spending the day at yorktown to dispatch franklin's division up the river actual contact with the enemy however made as it always did an exaggerated impression upon him the affair which when he heard of it at yorktown seemed to him a mere skirmish with a rear guard acquired a portentous importance when surveyed in the light of the bivouac at williamsburg amidst the actual and visible signs of a sanguinary conflict his dispatch to the war department written at ten o'clock the night of the battle betrays great agitation and his idiosyncrasy of multiplying the number of his enemy as a matter of course asserts itself i find general joe johnston in front of me in strong force probably greater a good deal than my own after a compliment to hancock he continues i learn from the prisoners taken that the rebels intend to dispute every step to richmond one can only wonder what he expected them to say i shall run the risk 
of at least holding them in check here while i resumed the original plan my entire force is undoubtedly inferior to that of the rebels who will fight well thus while johnston was profiting by the darkness to prepare to continue his retrograde march at daybreak mcclellan was nerving himself to stand the risk of holding his ground at williamsburg while he resumed the original plan of a movement by water the next day when he discovered that the enemy had moved away leaving their wounded on the field of battle his apprehension of attack subsided but other difficulties rose before him he telegraphed on the seventh to the secretary of war until the roads improve both in front and rear no large body of troops can be moved johnston had apparently no difficulty in moving his troops which mcclellan thought a larger body than his own reaching a place called baltimore crossroads johnston halted for five days and after receiving intelligence of the evacuation of norfolk and the destruction of the merrimac apprehending an attack upon richmond by way of the james river he ordered his forces to cross the chickahominy on the fifteenth two days after this the rebel army encamped about three miles from richmond in front of the line of redoubts that had been constructed the previous year it was a time of great apprehension almost of dismay at richmond the confederate president and most of his cabinet hastily sent their families to places of safety mr davis whose religious feelings always took on a peculiar intensity in critical times had himself baptized at home and privately confirmed at st paul's church there was great doubt whether the city could be successfully defended the most important archives of the government were sent some to lynchburg and some to columbia but general johnston had reason to confirm his opinion that mcclellan cared little for time the latter remained several days at williamsburg after he had ascertained that the enemy had disappeared from in front of him his visions of overwhelming forces of rebels were now transferred to franklin's front on the eighth he telegraphed the war department a story of eighty thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand opposed to franklin but in full retreat to the chickahominy on the tenth he sent an urgent appeal to washington for more men claiming that the enemy are collecting troops from all quarters especially well-disciplined troops from the south his own army would inevitably be reduced by sickness casualties garrisons and guards as if that of the enemy would not he therefore implored large and immediate reinforcements in a tone which implied that the president could make armies by executive decree if i am not reinforced he says it is probable that i will be obliged to fight nearly double my numbers strongly entrenched in face of a morning report of over one hundred thousand men present for duty he says i do not think it will be at all possible for me to bring more than seventy thousand men upon the field of battle he still protested stoutly against the original organization of his army corps and asked that he might be permitted to break it up or at least to suspend it he disliked his corps commanders and naturally wished his friends to exercise those important commands he blamed the corps organization for all the trouble at williamsburg and said if he had come on the field half an hour later all would have been lost the president was greatly wounded by this persistent manifestation of bad temper but bore it after his fashion with untiring patience and kindness he sent an official order authorizing mcclellan to suspend temporarily the corps organization in the army of the potomac and to adopt any that he might see fit until further orders at the same time he wrote a private letter to the general full of wise and kindly warning he said i ordered the army corps organization not only on the unanimous opinion of the twelve generals whom you had selected and assigned as generals of divisions but also on the unanimous opinion of every military man i could get an opinion from and every modern military book yourself only accepted of course i did not on my own judgment pretend to understand the subject i now think it indispensable for you to know how your struggle against it is received in quarters which we cannot entirely disregard it is looked upon as merely an effort to pamper one or two pets and to persecute and degrade their supposed rivals i have had no word from sumner heitzelman or keyes 
the commanders of these corps are of course the three highest officers with you but i am constantly told that you have no consultation or communication with them that you consult and communicate with nobody but general fitz john porter and perhaps general franklin i do not say these complaints are true or just but at all events it is proper you should know of their existence do the commanders of corps disobey your orders in anything when you relieved general hamilton of his command the other day you thereby lost the confidence of at least one of your best friends in the senate and here let me say not as applicable to you personally that senators and representatives speak of me in their places as they please without question and that officers of the army must cease addressing insulting letters to them for taking no greater liberty with them but to return are you strong enough are you strong enough even with my help to set your foot upon the necks of sumner heitzelman and keyes all at once this is a practical and very serious question for you the success of your army and the cause of the country are the same and of course i only desire the good of the cause general mcclellan accepted the authorization with alacrity and the sermon with indifference he had once formed two provisional army corps giving fitz john porter the command of one and franklin of the other after leaving williamsburg and joining his army at cumberland landing he reiterated his complaints and entreaties for reinforcements that it was not in the power of the government to send him his apprehension had grown to such an extent that on the fourteenth of may he telegraphed his conviction that he would be compelled with eighty thousand men to fight perhaps double my numbers in front of richmond and begged that the government would send him by water apparently he did not want them to come overland all the disposable troops every man that could be mustered the president anxious to leave nothing undone to help and encourage him replied to these importunate demands first by a friendly private note in which he said have done and shall do all i could and can to sustain you i hoped that the opening of james river and putting wool and burnside in communication with an open road to richmond or to you had effected something in that direction i am still unwilling to take all our force off the direct line between richmond and here he afterwards sent a dispatch through the war department received by mcclellan on may eighteen of which the essential points are as follows the president is not willing to uncover the capital entirely and it is believed that even if this were prudent it would require more time to effect a junction between your army and that of the rappahannock by the way of the potomac and york rivers than by a land march in order therefore to increase the strength of the attack upon richmond at the earliest moment general mcdowell has been ordered to march upon that city by the shortest route he is ordered keeping himself always in position to save the capital from all possible attack so to operate as to put his left wing in communication with your right wing and you are instructed to cooperate so as to establish this communication as soon as possible by extending your right wing to the north of richmond but charged in attempting this not to uncover the city of washington and you will give no order either before or after your junction which can put him out of position to cover this city the president desires that general mcdowell retain the command of the department of the rappahannock and of the forces with which he moves forward events as little foreseen by general mcclellan as by the government and which had by him been declared impossible the defeat of our forces in the shenandoah and the movement of a large rebel force to the upper potomac prevented the execution of this plan but it is worthy of notice that immediately on the receipt of the president's instructions while he was waiting for mcdowell to join him general mcclellan evinced no gratification at this compliance with his wishes on the contrary he lost no time in protesting against it and asking that mcdowell should be placed explicitly under his orders in the ordinary way in his report and in all his subsequent apologies for his campaign he makes this positive assertion this order rendered it impossible for me to use the james river as a line of operations and forced me to establish our depots on the pamunkey and to approach richmond from the north this charge is an evident afterthought we will permit it to be answered by general webb who is always the friend of mcclellan and his partisan wherever the writer's intelligence and conscience allow it 
he says after quoting the claim made by mcclellan in his report it is but repeating the proper criticisms made by other writers that general mcclellan had frequently mentioned the pamunkey as his prospective base that he made no representation to the government at the time that he wished to be free to move by the james and that it was within his power during the first three weeks of june when he found that mcdowell was again withheld from him to follow the latter route on one point there can be no question that the position of his army as already given along the left bank of the chickahominy from bottoms towards new bridge on may twenty with the white house on the pamunkey as the base of supplies was one of mcclellan's own choice uninfluenced by mcdowell's movements it required ten days after the fight at williamsburg for mcclellan's headquarters to reach cumberland landing on the south bank of the pamunkey and on the next day he established his permanent depot at white house near by on the twenty first the army was brought together and established in line on the chickahominy the right wing being about seven and the left about twelve miles from richmond from which they were separated by two formidable barriers the rebel army and the river with its environment of woods and swamps its fever breathing airs and its sudden floods the chickahominy was first attacked general mcclellan began at once with great energy the building of several bridges over the stream a work of special difficulty on account of the boggy banks which made long approaches necessary in this work and in a voluminous correspondence with the president in regard to reinforcements which we shall notice when we come to treat of those movements of jackson in the valley that caused the division of mcdowell's force he passed ten days he pushed the corps of keyes and heitzelman across the river and retained those of sumner franklin and porter on the north side the monotony of camp life was broken on the twenty seventh of may by a creditable feat of arms performed by fitz john porter and his corps near hanover court house where he attacked and defeated a rebel force under general branch the chief value of this engagement was its demonstration of the splendid marching and fighting qualities of the troops engaged general mcclellan was greatly annoyed that the president did not seem to attach sufficient importance to this action but general johnston in his narrative while not diminishing the gallantry of porter and his troops or denying the complete defeat of branch treats it merely as an incident of branch's march under orders to join general joseph r anderson which was accomplished the same day at the point designated for this junction there was no sequel to the fight porter and his victorious troops marched back to camp on the twenty sixth of may general mcclellan informed the president that he was quietly closing in upon the enemy preparatory to the last struggle and that he would be free to strike on the return of porter but several days elapsed without the blow being struck until the enemy as usual accelerated matters by himself striking it had been for some time the intention of general johnston to attack the union army before mcdowell should join it and learning on the day of the battle of hanover court house that mcdowell was leaving fredericksburg he resolved at once to strike mcclellan's force on both sides of the river when we consider that the consolidated returns of the army of the potomac for the thirty first of may showed an aggregate of a hundred and twenty seven thousand one hundred and sixty six officers and men of whom there were ninety eight thousand and eight present for duty with two hundred and eighty pieces of field artillery and that general johnston's force amounted to upwards of sixty two thousand effectives we cannot but think it was a fortunate circumstance for him that he did not attempt to carry this heroic plan into effect at night when he had called his general officers together for their instructions johnston was informed that mcdowell's force which had been marching southward had returned to fredericksburg he then abandoned his idea of attacking mcclellan on both sides of the river and reverted to his former plan of assailing with the greater part of his force the two corps on the south bank as soon as they had sufficiently increased the distance between themselves and the three corps on the north in this plan as in the other one and we shall see farther on that the same was the case with general lee general johnston does not seem to have been greatly troubled about a possible initiative of general mcclellan mcclellan evidently had no suspicion of johnston's intentions 
at the moment that the latter was calling his generals together to give orders for the assault mcclellan was telegraphing to washington richmond papers urge johnston to attack now he has us away from gunboats i think he is too able for that johnston's purpose was finally adopted and put in action with great decision and promptitude on the thirtieth d h hill informed him that the federals were in force at seven pines and that the indications were that all of keyes's corps was south of the river to which johnston immediately responded by telling him he would attack the next morning orders were given to throw twenty-three of the twenty-seven brigades of which the confederate army consisted against the two corps of heitzelman and keyes the rest were to observe the river by the meadow and new bridges after the plan of battle was arranged a violent storm of rain came on and continued most of the night this was a welcome incident to johnston as it inspired the hope that the river might overflow its banks and sever the communication between the two wings of the federal army he did not permit the rain to delay him though the swollen creeks and soggy woods retarded the movements of his troops the division commanded by d h hill attacked casey's division of keyes's corps with great impetuosity about one o'clock in the afternoon of may thirty one keyes's corps supported later by that of heitzelman defended their ground with gallantry and pertinacity against the forces of hill aided and supported by the divisions of longstreet and huger but when night came on they had been forced back more than a mile and a half east of the position that they had occupied in the morning the forces under g w smith accompanied by johnston in person were in reserve near the junction of the new bridge and nine mile roads on account of a peculiar condition of the atmosphere the sound of the musketry at seven pines had not reached johnston and smith but about four o'clock johnston having been informed of the progress of affairs in longstreet's front determined to put smith in upon the union right flank being by this time relieved of all fear of a reinforcement from the other side of the river fortunately for the union cause the forces immediately opposite this position were commanded by general sumner an officer whose strongest traits were soldierly ardor and generosity he had been ordered as soon as the firing began to hold himself in readiness to move to the assistance of his comrades at fair oaks but he gave these orders a liberal interpretation and instead of merely preparing to move he at once marched with two divisions to the two bridges he had built and halted them with his leading companies at the bridges in this manner an hour of inestimable advantage was saved the swollen river soon carried away one of the bridges and the other was almost submerged when the order came to sumner to cross without delaying a moment on the west bank sumner marched through the thick mud in the direction of the heaviest firing and repulsed the attack of smith who had been pressing the troops under couch the latter at fair oaks having become separated from keyes's main force at seven pines this union success was the result of sumner's straightforward and unhesitating march his appointment to the command of an army corps had been bitterly opposed and never forgiven by general mcclellan he had been treated by his commander with studied neglect and disrespect and this magnificent service was his only revenge about seven o'clock the confederates met their severest mischance of the day general johnston received at an interval of a few moments two severe and disabling wounds the firing ceased terminated by darkness only johnston is careful to say before he had been borne a mile from the field the command had devolved by seniority of rank upon general g w smith there was great confusion and discouragement in the rebel councils jefferson davis found hope in the suggestion that the enemy might withdraw during the night which would give the confederates the moral effect of a victory early on june first the battle was renewed and the union troops reoccupied part of the ground east of seven pines that had been lost on the day before at two o'clock after the battle had ceased general lee took command and during the night the confederates withdrew a great battle had been fought absolutely without result the confederates had failed in their attempt to destroy mcclellan's two outlying corps but their failure entailed no other consequences 
the losses were frightful upon both sides the union army in the two days lost five thousand thirty one and the confederates six thousand one hundred and thirty four but there was this enormous difference between the condition of the two armies the union troops south of the chickahominy though wearied by the conflict with ranks thinned by death and wounds had yet suffered no loss of morale on the contrary their spirits had been heightened by the stubborn fight of saturday and the easy victory of sunday north of the river lay the larger portion of the army which had not fired a gun nor lost a man in the action jackson was in the valley of the shenandoah detaching from the main army a force of sixteen thousand men the enemy had thrown two-thirds of his whole force against mcclellan's left wing and had received more injury than he inflicted our right wing was intact the material for bridging the upper chickahominy had been ready for three days even so ardent a friend of mcclellan as the prince de joinville writes the federals had had the defensive battle they desired had repulsed the enemy but arrested by natural obstacles which perhaps were not insurmountable they had gained nothing by their success they had missed an unique opportunity of striking a blow but the next day and during the week that followed the enterprise assumed so many difficulties that mcclellan could not have been expected to attempt it the rains continued the sluggish river became a wide spreading flood the ground a mixed mass of clay and quicksand afforded no sure standing place for horse foot or artillery most of the bridges were carried away the army virtually cut in two by the river occupied itself in the arduous work of entrenching general lee the ablest officer in the southern confederacy his mind put entirely at ease in regard to an immediate attack upon richmond had leisure to devote himself to restoring the organization and morale of his army and bringing from every side the reinforcements that he was to use with such effect a month later in the bloody contests from the chickahominy to the james End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay stonewall jackson's valley campaign as we have said before it was the intention of the administration to dispatch the whole of mcdowell's corps to reinforce mcclellan as soon as the situation in northern virginia would permit franklin's division was so dispatched in ample time to have taken part in the operations against yorktown though general mcclellan made no use whatever of that fine body of troops until yorktown was evacuated preparations were vigorously made by the government for the march of mcdowell towards richmond and shields's division one of the best of banks's army was ordered to reinforce him the most important results were expected from such an attack as an officer of mcdowell's ability and zeal would have made upon the left flank of the confederate forces in front of richmond it is one of the admitted misfortunes of the war that this attack was never made and the question as to who was responsible for it has given rise to much discussion a simple statement of the facts in the case without imputation of ignoble motives in any quarter seems the preferable way to treat this subject it may be profitable for a moment to consider the character of that remarkable man whose campaign in the shenandoah valley produced this derangement of the plans of the government general thomas jonathan commonly called stonewall jackson was by far the most interesting and picturesque figure in the southern army his brilliant successes and his early death enshrined him in the hearts of his associates as their foremost champion while the intense religious enthusiasm which appeared in all his public and private utterances added the halo of the saint to the laurels of the hero 
in what we shall have to say in regard to this singular character we shall refer to no facts except those recorded by confederate writers and although we may not be able to accept all their conclusions it cannot be contested that general jackson was a man of extraordinary qualities and a soldier whose successes were due no less to his abilities than to his good fortune and the mistakes of his adversaries though connected with a family of fair standing in virginia his father died poor after wasting his substance in drink and play the boy grew up in the care of relatives twice running away from the roof which sheltered him and returning soiled ragged and emaciated by the ague his early education was defective he earned his living by hard labor and for a time served as a rural constable until he accidentally received an appointment to the military academy at west point he is remembered by his contemporaries there as a slow dull unprepossessing youth of great correctness of conduct and untiring industry in his studies he served creditably in the mexican war and soon after it ended resigned his place in the army and became a teacher in the virginia military school at lexington where he lived for ten years he was not especially popular or successful as a teacher his manner was lacking in tact his character in flexibility had the war not come to call him forth to glory and the grave he would probably have lived and died in that mountain village known only to his neighbors to use dr dabney's expression as a sincere odd weak man we find in the writings of several of his eulogists indications of singularities which border upon monomania colonel fremantle says on the authority of the confederate general slaughter when he left the united states service he was under the impression that one of his legs was getting shorter than the other and afterwards his idea was that he only perspired on one side and that it was necessary to keep the arm and leg of the other side in constant motion in order to preserve the circulation but the war was his opportunity there was not a quality of heart mind or temperament which he possessed that did not contribute to his success and his fame even his weaknesses ministered to his strength he had been a sufferer from ophthalmia and could not use his eyes at night he had therefore acquired the habit of reviewing mentally all the reading of the day while sitting silent in the midst of his family with his face to the wall and had thus gained a remarkable power of concentration of thought and memory of details his digestion in his youth was feeble and capricious he had for that reason accustomed himself to the utmost abstemiousness and it was no sacrifice to him to share the meagre fare of his soldiers on the march but the quality which gained for him much of his influence in the army and which contributed most largely to that sentiment of devotion with which his memory is regarded in the south and in england was his intense religious enthusiasm anything like it is rarely met with in modern times we must go back to the ages of unquestioning faith to philip the second to torquemada to find a parallel to it he believed himself to be under the immediate and partisan protection of his creator he believed and his biographer thinks the belief perfectly reasonable that heaven helped him plan his campaigns and battles his creator was ever present to his mind in his own image as good a southerner as earnest a hater of the yankees as stern a fighter as himself he conversed with him constantly he interpreted literally the injunction to pray without ceasing when we take our meals he would say there is the grace when i take a draught of water i always pause as my palate receives the refreshment to lift up my heart to god in thanks and prayer for the water of life whenever i drop a letter into the box of the post-office i send a petition along with it for god's blessing upon its mission and upon the person to whom it is sent when i break the seal of a letter just received i stop to pray to god that he may prepare me for its contents and make it a messenger of good 
and so of every other familiar act of the day a great part of his time in the saddle was passed in the act of prayer a hundred times a day he would be seen to throw his right hand aloft and to move his lips in silent supplication his constant entreaty to his friends was that they should continually pray that he might be the instrument to wreak heaven's purposes upon his adversaries he believed himself selected especially for the work he was doing he was a hammer in the hands of god for the destruction of the ungodly the firmest convictions of religious duty were easily reconciled with the exigencies of the military service which seemed to violate them he was a fanatical sabbatarian he would not read a letter which arrived saturday night until monday he would not post one in such a way that it would travel on the sabbath yet he would not scruple to bring on a bloody battle on sunday if he could catch his enemy at a disadvantage in that case of course it was the lord's will when he was sent to destroy some railroad property he thought with regret how many bibles could have been printed with the proceeds but none the less he destroyed it the self-consciousness inseparable from such a temperament took with him its usual contrasted forms of shyness and vanity his biographer quotes him as relating that when in mexico he made the acquaintance of some agreeable spanish families but finding the ladies too fascinating he firmly withdrew himself before his self-respect was tarnished there were no bounds to his bashful self-conceit he did not scruple to say on every occasion where the feasibility of certain accomplishments was referred to i can accomplish anything i will to perform in matters of trivial concern such as diet and drink he held himself up as a model do as i do he would say my head never aches when he first began to lead in public prayer his excessive self-consciousness made the effort painful to himself and others but none the less he persevered it was especially characteristic of him that he ascribed to the deity the credit of all that was done for him at every promotion he received he burst forth into ardent ejaculations of praise to heaven none of god's creatures ever received his thanks when he got his first important command he said i am very thankful to my kind heavenly father for having given me such a fine brigade after bull run nettled at not having got what he deemed his fair share of newspaper notice he wrote to his wife god made my brigade more instrumental than any other in repulsing the main attack and again my brigade is not a brigade of newspaper correspondence i know that the first brigade was the first to meet and pass our retreating forces to push on with no other aid than the smiles of god to arrest the victorious foe etc etc later when the honours he had so fairly won began to come to him he wrote i am very thankful to that good god who withholds no good thing from me though i am so utterly unworthy and so ungrateful for making me a major-general of the provisional army of the confederate states his joy at his promotion however did not prevent him from saying to his pastor who was visiting his camp that promotion among men was a temptation and a trouble and that he would not accept it except in the light of a duty he seemed incapable of gratitude to anything mortal reminding one of philip the second who built a monastery to god and st lawrence to commemorate a victory and sent the generals who had won it to the scaffold his efforts at evangelizing the negroes of which so much is made by his eulogists had a peculiar character he established and carried on a sunday school for them with unflinching zeal but he was too sincere an adherent of slavery to give anything but oral instruction the alphabet was too dangerous an engine to trust in their hands they received their hymns catechisms and texts directly from the lips of their teachers as was the general custom in the south yet on one occasion he went among the free blacks and encouraged them to contribute out of their poverty for the funds of the bible society 
professor dabney says he required all his slaves to attend the domestic worship of his family morning and evening and succeeded where so many christian masters have found entire success apparently impossible in securing the presence of every one but in the same paragraph the eulogist naively gives the key of his success absolute obedience was the rule of his household and if he found chastisement was necessary to secure this it was faithfully administered in all these singular traits of character we discern a striking resemblance to another of the remarkable personages of this great conflict if john brown of osawatomie had been bred in a slave state and had received a west point training it is hard to see in what particular he would have differed from stonewall jackson it was natural that such a character as this should play a great part in a civil war with his early training to the military art his knowledge of details rendered unusually accurate by ten years of teaching his memory extraordinarily strengthened by the exercises to which it had been subjected a temperament of the greatest eagerness and ardour in the pursuit of his purposes a will of iron an energy which knew no fatigue and required no stimulus a devotion to the supposed interests of his section heightened by his frank hatred and contempt of his enemy a feeling of invincibility and a disregard of danger natural to one who had no doubt of the continual presence of the lord of hosts by his side helping him plant his batteries and array his columns for attack and above all an intense love of fighting for its own sake and for the sake of fame for which he longed with a devouring thirst all these qualities combined to make him the first of the subordinate southern leaders a soldier incomparable for any employment where energy celerity and audacity were desired he won great credit at the battle of bull run but his first independent campaign resulted in signal defeat in march eighteen sixty two he was ordered by general johnston to occupy the attention of banks in the shenandoah valley he advanced rapidly in pursuance of what he understood to be the spirit of his orders and came in view of shields's division at kernstown near winchester on the twenty second of march a brief skirmish took place that evening in the course of which general shields was severely wounded his arm being broken by the fragment of a shell he retired to winchester and general nathan kimball remained on the field in active command of the division the next day although it was sunday jackson thinking he had his enemy at a disadvantage and unaware either of his numbers or his disposition attacked kimball with great impetuosity but met with a severe repulse kimball who was ably seconded by colonels jeremiah c carroll and erastus b tyler not only beat off the attack of jackson from both his flanks but at the right moment assumed the offensive and after a hotly contested fight lasting two hours as night was closing in he completely defeated the confederates who were driven from the field leaving their dead and wounded and several guns banks coming from harper's ferry the next day continued the pursuit up the valley as far as mount jackson shields's division in this action numbered about seven thousand jackson reported his own force as between three thousand and three thousand five hundred the losses reported on each side are shields five hundred and ninety jackson seven hundred and eighteen jackson frankly acknowledged his defeat saying to johnston i engaged him the enemy yesterday about three p m near winchester and fought until dusk but his forces were so superior to mine that he repulsed me with the loss of valuable officers and men killed and wounded but from the obstinacy with which our troops fought and from their advantageous position i am of the opinion that his loss was greater than mine in troops but i lost one piece of artillery and three caissons jackson's second campaign in the shenandoah which gained him in full measure that fame and position which were so near to his heart occupied about a month it may be said to have begun in his attack upon general milroy's forces at mcdowell on the eighth of may 
in this affair as in every battle of this famous campaign he had much larger forces than those opposed to him a fact entirely to his credit there were union troops enough in the department if they had been properly brought together to have overwhelmed him after a fight of several hours he defeated milroy who fell back to join fremont at the town of franklin while jackson moved eastward to harrisonburg on the way he sent dispatches to richmond detailing the position of the union troops and asking permission to attack them this was granted and he at once began a swift and stealthy march through new market and luray to front royal it was at this time that mcclellan was daily clamoring for reinforcements from washington and the government yielding to his importunity had promised that mcdowell's corps should march overland to join him the reasons why this promise could not be kept are best set forth in the following dispatch from mr lincoln whose communications to his generals were always clearer and more definite than any that he received from them it is dated may twenty five general banks was at strasburg with about six thousand men shields having been taken from him to swell a column for mcdowell to aid you at richmond and the rest of his force scattered at various places on the twenty third a rebel force of seven thousand to ten thousand fell upon one regiment and two companies guarding the bridge at fort royal destroying it entirely crossed the shenandoah and on the twenty fourth yesterday pushed on to get north of banks on the road to winchester general banks ran a race with them beating them into winchester yesterday evening this morning a battle ensued between the two forces in which general banks was beaten back into full retreat toward martinsburg and probably is broken up into a total rout geary on the manassas gap railroad just now reports that jackson is now near front royal with ten thousand troops following up and supporting as i understand the force now pursuing banks also that another force of ten thousand is near orleans following on in the same direction in this geary was mistaken jackson's and ewell's forces amounted to sixteen thousand or seventeen thousand stripped bare as we are here i will do all we can to prevent them crossing the potomac at harper's ferry or above mcdowell has about twenty thousand of his forces moving back to the vicinity of front royal and fremont who was at franklin is moving to harrisonburg both these movements intended to get in the enemy's rear one more of mcdowell's brigades is ordered through here to harper's ferry the rest of his forces remain for the present at fredericksburg we are sending such regiments and dribs from here and baltimore as we can spare to harper's ferry supplying their places in some sort by calling in militia from the adjacent states we also have eighteen cannon on the road to harper's ferry of which arm there is not a single one at that point this is now our situation if mcdowell's force was now beyond our reach we should be entirely helpless apprehensions of something like this and no unwillingness to sustain you have always been my reason for withholding mcdowell's forces from you please understand this and do the best you can with the forces you have later in the day the president now sure that a large and formidable army was drawing near the potomac wrote a sharp dispatch to mcclellan urging him either to take this opportunity to attack richmond or give up the job to which the general replied calmly that the object of the movement is probably to prevent reinforcements being sent to me and that the time was very near when he would attack richmond the campaign opened thus inauspiciously for the union arms went rapidly from bad to worse a series of doleful mischances succeeded unrelieved by a ray of good fortune or good conduct mr lincoln at washington was exerting himself to the utmost sending a dozen dispatches a day to banks fremont mcdowell and mcclellan all admirable in clearness intelligence and temper always directing the right thing to be done and the best way of doing it but nothing seemed to avail the original surprise was inexcusable on the twentieth of may fremont had reported to banks that jackson was on the way to attack him but no proper preparation was made 
after the defeat at front royal on the twenty third and at winchester on the twenty fifth while banks was in retreat to the potomac the only thought of the president was to stop jackson at the river and to detain him until a sufficient force could be gathered in the neighborhood of strasburg to destroy or capture him on his return fremont was ordered to cross the mountains to harrisonburg and come north down the valley with his force mcdowell with a competent detachment under shields was ordered to front royal the victorious force of jackson was met by a considerable army at the potomac these last were mostly raw levies not inured to marching or to fighting but they accomplished their purpose of delaying for the moment the advance of jackson towards washington his own intention as well as his orders from richmond were in the language of general dabney to press the enemy at harper's ferry threaten an invasion of maryland and an assault upon the federal capital and thus make the most energetic diversion possible but on the twenty ninth while at halltown preparing for an attack upon harper's ferry he received information of the movement of troops that had been ordered by the president which as dabney says imperiously required him to give up that attack and provide for his own safety he then began his precipitate retreat up the valley which by its celerity and success gained him even more credit than did his audacious advance it ought not to have been allowed to succeed it was perfectly feasible to prevent it had the plain orders of the president been obeyed jackson could not have escaped from the predicament where his headlong energy and his contempt for his adversaries had placed him it is idle to talk of his invincibility he was generally whipped like other men when the conditions were not favorable to him he was defeated severely at kernstown in march when he had been confident of victory later at gaines's mill he did not particularly distinguish himself above others at white oak swamp bridge and malvern hill his inefficiency in large tactics was recognized and severely criticized by generals on his own side and banks with one-third his force gave him all the work he could do at cedar mountain if fremont and mcdowell had met him at strasburg and banks had followed upon his heels as mr lincoln had clearly and explicitly ordered nothing could have prevented the capture or destruction of his entire command each of these generals had his task assigned him it was in each case perfectly practicable it involved only an expeditious march to the neighborhood of strasburg over roads more or less rough undisturbed by the presence of an enemy in any considerable force general mcdowell's part of the work was performed with his habitual energy and promptitude notwithstanding the chagrin and displeasure with which he received his orders near evening of the twenty fourth of may the president sent him a dispatch informing him that fremont had been ordered by telegraph to move from franklin on harrisonburg to relieve banks and capture or destroy jackson's and ewell's forces mr lincoln continued you are instructed laying aside for the present the movement on richmond to put twenty thousand men in motion at once for the shenandoah moving on the line or in advance of the line of the manassas gap railroad your object will be to capture the forces of jackson and ewell either in cooperation with general fremont or in case want of supplies or of transportation interferes with his movements it is believed that the force with which you move will be sufficient to accomplish this object alone the information thus far received here makes it probable that if the enemy operate actively against general banks you will not be able to count upon much assistance from him but may even have to release him it is remarkable that the president saw the situation with such accuracy the day before banks's defeat at winchester this order mcdowell though he called it a crushing blow obeyed at once directing shields to take up his march to catlett's a station on the orange and alexandria road about half-way between fredericksburg and front royal and reporting that he had done so 
the president sent him an acknowledgment of his alacrity at the same time expressing his regret at the change of his orders and adding everything now depends upon the celerity and vigor of your movements this encouraged the general to make an earnest though respectful protest which he sent the same night to the president setting forth his belief that cooperation between himself and fremont was not to be counted upon that it would take him a week or ten days to get to the valley that by that time the enemy would have retired we shall see later that these forebodings at least were not realized at the same time he telegraphed to wadsworth in command at washington his deep disgust he did not think the rebel force in the mountains amounted to five thousand men but with all this grumbling his deeds were better than his words he pushed shields forward with the greatest celerity shields who was burning to go to richmond marched obediently but in very bad humor the dispatches of this officer read like a burlesque of those of his superior he is loud in contempt of both armies in the shenandoah he thought when the movement first began that there was nothing in it that the enemy would never come north that if they did they would be hemmed in and destroyed as late as the tenth of may he was sure they were not there to fight as he went forward to front royal his boasting spirit asserted itself more and more i want no assistance he said he promised to give jackson a bloody reception to drive the enemy from the shenandoah and wanted to know if there was anything else he could do for the president the task in question being apparently unworthy of his powers but neither the chagrin of mcdowell nor the cascinating of shields prevented them from striving with all their might to do the work assigned them the president kept mcdowell constantly informed of the condition of affairs detailing the progress of jackson northward and urging the value and importance of the service expected of the union troops mcdowell showed himself as he always was worthy of the confidence reposed in him in spite of all obstacles accidents by rail bad roads and rough weather he got shields's advance into front royal on the thirtieth of may that is in little more than half the time he thought he should require for the purpose the same day the president sent him a dispatch from fremont saying that he would be at strasburg or where the enemy was at four p m may thirty one and another from saxton at harper's ferry indicating that the enemy was still there the president added with justifiable exultation it seems the game is before you it remains to be seen how general fremont executed his share of the task on the twenty fourth the president gave him an urgent order to move at once by way of harrisonburg to the relief of banks he promptly replied that he would move as ordered but made the unfortunate error of choosing an entirely different route from the one assigned him thinking the road to harrisonburg was more or less obstructed and off his line of supplies he moved northward by way of petersburg and moorfield in the great valley lying west of the shenandoah mountains and did not even inform the president of this discretionary modification of his orders so that on the twenty seventh when they were anxiously expecting at washington to hear from him at harrisonburg they were astounded at receiving tidings from him at moorfield two good days march from the line of jackson's retreat and separated by two counties and the shenandoah range from the place where he was desired and expected to be in response to the president's peremptory question why he was at moorfield when he was ordered to harrisonburg he made an unsatisfactory reply alleging the necessity of his choice of route and his assumed discretion as to his orders dropping this matter the president began again urging him forward to strasburg there was still time to repair the original error jackson was on the potomac much farther from the rendezvous than fremont but the latter could not be made to see the vital necessity of immediate action his men were weary his supplies were deficient the roads were bad blenker's corps was straggling badly finally on the twenty ninth of may his medical director told him his army needed a whole day's rest he promptly accepted this suggestion and wasted twenty-four hours in this manner while jackson was rushing his ragged troops who had known no rest for a month 
up the narrow valley that formed his only outlet from destruction or captivity in one day says dabney the stonewall brigade marched from hall town to the neighborhood of newton a distance of thirty-five miles and the second virginia accomplished a march of more than forty miles without rations over muddy roads and amidst continual showers the race was to the swift as fremont's advance entered strasburg on the first of june the rear guard of jackson's force was still in sight leaving the place the plan of the president well combined and reasonable as it was had failed though no fault of his and jackson had escaped it is the contention of general mcclellan and his partisans that the plan could not possibly have succeeded one critic disposes of the matter by a sneer at the thought of trapping the wily fox who was master of every gap and gorge in the valley but an army of sixteen thousand men of all arms is not a fox it must have roads to cross mountains and bridges to pass over rivers if fremont had obeyed orders and had been where he should have been on the thirtieth of may and if banks and saxton had kept a closer watch at harper's ferry and followed more immediately upon jackson's rear jackson would have been surrounded at strasburg by three times his own force and would have been captured or his army dispersed and destroyed this would have been richly worth all its cost and the most captious or malevolent critic would have had nothing to say against the president who ordered it there was little prospect of defeating jackson after he had slipped through the gap between fremont and mcdowell at strasburg but nevertheless an energetic pursuit was begun by fremont up the shenandoah and by part of shields's division up the luray valley on the east the former harassing jackson's rear with almost daily skirmishes and the latter running a race with him on a parallel line there was hardly a possibility now of regaining the lost opportunity no matter how severely pressed it was almost surely in jackson's power to escape across brown's gap to albemarle county where he would for a time be safe from pursuit and this course says dabney was in his mind as a final resort but he was not even driven to this there was one last chance of inflicting great damage upon him one of shields's brigades arrived at the bridge at port republic before him and should either have taken and held or destroyed it the officer in command did neither and the bridge immediately after fell into jackson's hands giving him command of both sides of the river the confederate general and his adjutant and biographer ascribed the capture of this important position to supernatural means as soon as jackson uttered his command to seize the bridge he drew up his horse and dropping the reins upon his neck raised both his hands towards the heavens while the fire of battle in his face changed into a look of reverential awe even while he prayed the god of battles heard or ever he had withdrawn his uplifted hands the bridge was gained it would perhaps be irreverent to add that the bridge was not defended on the same day june eight he fought a sharp but indecisive battle with fremont at cross keys and retiring in the night he attacked and defeated shields's small detachment at port republic the mismanagement of the union generals had opposed to him on both days forces greatly inferior to his own before these battles were fought the president seeing that further pursuit was useless had ordered shields back to mcdowell fremont to halt at harrisonburg for orders and banks to guard the posts of front royal and luray the orders came too late to prevent two unfortunate engagements but they showed that the civilian at washington was wiser than the two generals at the front they both passed thereafter into the ranks of the malcontents the men with grievances shields went back to washington where he was received with open arms by the habitual critics of the president among them were those of his own household for we read in mr chase's diary that shields told him when he was ordered back that jackson's capture was certain and the general and the secretary held harmonious counsel together over the terrible mistakes of the president this was the last important service of fremont he remained in charge of his department a few weeks longer until he was placed with others of similar rank under the general command of pope he refused to serve under his junior and was relieved not appearing again in any conspicuous position except for a moment in the summer of eighteen sixty four as a candidate for the presidency in opposition 
to mr lincoln end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay chapter twenty three the seven days battles after the battle of fair oaks as well as before it general mcclellan kept up his continual cry for reinforcements the hallucination that the enemy's force was double his own had become fixed upon him and all his plans and combinations were poisoned by this fatal error the president did everything in his power to satisfy the general's unreasonable demands he resolved to give him absolute control of all the troops on the peninsula and knowing that general wool would never consent to being placed under mcclellan's orders that veteran having expressed himself with characteristic severity in regard to his junior's insatiable demand for troops the president thought best to remove general wool to baltimore transferring general dix to fort monroe and placing him under the direct command of mcclellan a proceeding which greatly displeased general dix but to which he yielded under protest his displeasure did not interfere with his convictions of duty immediately on arriving at fort monroe he sent to general mcclellan a reinforcement of ten of the best regiments there no efforts were spared to help and to encourage mcclellan both the president and the secretary of war were perpetually sending him kind and complimentary messages in addition to the troops and guns which they gathered in from every quarter for him a few days after fair oaks in response to his repeated entreaties mccall's division of mcdowell's corps a splendid body of about ten thousand men was dispatched to him he was for the moment delighted at hearing that these troops were coming and having thus obtained the greater part of mcdowell's corps he said june seven i am glad to learn that you are pressing forward reinforcements so vigorously i shall be in perfect readiness to move forward and take richmond the moment mccall reaches here and the ground will admit the passage of artillery mccall and his perfectly appointed division of ten thousand men and five batteries of artillery began to arrive on the eleventh and were all present for duty on the thirteenth and as if providence were uniting with the government to satisfy both the general's requirements he was able to telegraph on the twelfth weather now good roads and ground rapidly drying the weather continued remarkably fine for several days general keyes on the fifteenth reported white oak swamp dried up so as to be fordable in many places but the dry spell did not last and on the night of the fifteenth general mcclellan sends to washington a note of lamentation saying that the rain has begun again which will retard our movements somewhat it is characteristic of him that he always regarded bad weather as exclusively injurious to him and never to the other side the president once said of him that he seemed to think in defiance of scripture that heaven sent its rain only on the just and not on the unjust to an energetic general all kinds of weather have their uses johnston did not allow the terrible storm of may thirty to prevent his attack at seven pines and we have seen how grant at the very outset of his career speaking of the bad weather and the wretched roads on which he had to march said this however will operate worse upon the enemy than upon us it must not be forgotten that although mcclellan and his apologists have been for years denouncing the government for having withheld from him mcdowell's corps the best part of that corps was actually sent to him franklin's magnificent division went to him in april mccall's equally fine division was dispatched to him before the middle of june in each case he said he only awaited the coming of that particular division to undertake immediate active operations 
and in each case on the arrival of the eagerly demanded reinforcements he did nothing but wait the good pleasure of the enemy his own official reports show that he received by way of reinforcements after his arrival in the peninsula and prior to the fifteenth of june not less than thirty nine thousand four hundred and forty one men of whom there were thirty two thousand three hundred and sixty present for duty yet all this counted for nothing with him he let hardly a day pass without clamouring for more he was not even inclined to allow the administration any discretion in regard to the manner in which he was to be reinforced he insisted that mcdowell should be sent to him by water and not by land so that he should come in by his rear instead of by his right flank and when he was informed that mccall's force was expected to be restored to mcdowell's corps when that army joined him he bitterly resented it he said it did not show a proper spirit in mcdowell and added sullenly if i cannot fully control all his troops i want none of them but would prefer to fight the battle with what i have and let others be responsible for the results these petulant outbursts were met with unwearied patience and kindness on the part of the president on the fifteenth of june he wrote the secretary of war has turned over to me your dispatch about sending mcdowell to you by water instead of by land i now fear he cannot get to you either way in time shields's division has got so terribly out of shape out at elbows and out at toes that it will require a long time to get it in again i expect to see mcdowell within a day or two when i will again talk with him about the mode of moving mccall's division has nearly or quite reached you by now this with what you get from general wool's old command and the new regiment sent you must give you an increase since the late battles of over twenty thousand doubtless the battles and other causes have decreased you half as much in the same time but then the enemy have lost as many in the same way i believe i would come and see you were it not that i fear my presence might divert you and the army from more important matters from this it will be seen that mcclellan had no right to delay operations an hour after mccall's arrival from any pretended expectation of the immediate coming of mcdowell and indeed he admits in his report that as early as the seventh of june he had given up any such expectation with no reason therefore for delay but with every conceivable incentive to action with an army amounting after mccall joined him to the imposing figure of one hundred and fifty six thousand eight hundred and thirty eight of whom an aggregate present of one hundred and twenty seven thousand three hundred and twenty seven is reported by mcclellan himself as of the twentieth of june though he makes a reduction to one hundred and fourteen thousand six hundred and ninety one of those present for duty equipped he wasted the month of june in a busy and bustling activity which was in its results equivalent to mere idleness he was directly invited to attack by the fine weather of the middle of the month which he describes as splendid in a dispatch of the seventeenth and by the absence of stonewall jackson in the valley with his sixteen thousand veterans reinforced by ten thousand troops from lee's army as mcclellan himself believed and reported on the eighteenth the president by a dispatch of the same date urged him to take advantage of this opportunity saying if this is true it is as good as a reinforcement to you of an equal force i could better dispose of things if i could know about what day you can attack richmond and would be glad to be informed if you think you can inform me with safety the terms in which general mcclellan answered this inquiry are worthy of quotation as an illustration of that air of energy and determination which he so often introduced into the expression of his intentions while leaving as in the last lines of this dispatch a loophole for indefinite delay our army is well over the chickahominy except the very considerable forces necessary to protect our flanks and communications our whole line of pickets in front runs within six miles of richmond the rebel line runs within musket range of ours 
each has heavy support at hand a general engagement may take place any hour an advance by us involves a battle more or less decisive the enemy exhibit at every point a readiness to meet us they certainly have great numbers and extensive works if ten thousand or fifteen thousand men have left richmond to reinforce jackson it illustrates their strength and confidence this is a singularly characteristic view the fact of a large detachment having left lee affords him no encouragement it simply impresses him all the more with the idea of his enemy's strength after to-morrow we shall fight the rebel army as soon as providence will permit we shall await only a favourable condition of the earth and sky and the completion of some necessary preliminaries as usual it was the enemy that startled mcclellan out of his procrastination on the thirteenth of june general j e b stuart with some twelve hundred confederate cavalry and a few guns started to ride around mcclellan's army touching on his way the south anna railroad bridge hanover courthouse tunstall station on the york river railway and thence to jones's bridge on the chickahominy which he stopped to repair crossing it on the fifteenth and entering richmond by the river road the next day it has rarely been the fortune of a general to inflict such an insult upon an opponent without injury general mcclellan did not seem to feel that any discredit attached to him for this performance on the contrary he congratulated himself that stuart had done so little harm the burning of two schooners laden with forage and fourteen government wagons the destruction of some sutler's stores the killing of several of the guard and teamsters at garlic's landing some little damage done at tunstall station and a little eclat were the precise results of this expedition mcclellan had for some time been vaguely meditating a change of base to the james river and this raid of stuart seems to have somewhat strengthened this purpose fitz john porter who more than any other possessed his confidence says that mcclellan desired to effect this movement as soon as he gave up looking for mcdowell to join him which we have seen from his report was in the first week of june as early as june eighteen porter says he sent vessels loaded with supplies to the james river it is not intended to intimate that he was fully resolved upon this course but he appears to have kept it constantly before him in his undecided irresolute way all through the month his communication with commodore john rogers who commanded on the james indicates a purpose to move to some point on that river he says on the twenty fourth in a few days i hope to gain such a position as to enable me to place a force above balls and drury's bluffs so that we can remove the obstructions and place ourselves in communication with you so that you can cooperate in the final attack in the meantime please keep some gunboats as near drury's bluff as prudence will permit on the twenty fifth he pushed forward his picket line in front of seven pines to within four miles of richmond a point farther in advance than he had yet reached at the same time he issued orders to his corps commanders south of the river that they were not to regard these new positions as their field of battle but were to fall back if attacked to their old entrenchments he had by this time heard of the arrival of jackson's corps and also credited a false and impossible rumor of the arrival of beauregard and his troops from the west he was fully informed of the attack threatened within a few hours and yet he sent to washington for more troops if i had another good division i could laugh at jackson he said while he knew that jackson was marching upon his right he made his usual complaint and threat of putting the responsibility where it belonged these wanton accusations at such a time moved the president not to anger but to genuine sorrow yet he answered with almost incredible patience your three dispatches of yesterday in relation to the affair ending with the statement that you completely succeeded in making your point are very gratifying 
the later one suggesting the probability of your being overwhelmed by two hundred thousand and talking of where the responsibility will belong pains me very much i give you all i can and act on the presumption that you will do the best you can with what you have while you continue ungenerously i think to assume that i could give you more if i would i have omitted and shall omit no opportunity to send you reinforcements whenever i possibly can it is impossible to say how long his desultory preparations would have lasted if general mcclellan had been left to himself but after the twenty third of june the power of deciding upon what day he should attack had already passed out of his hands general lee had made at his leisure all his arrangements for attacking the union army and had chosen the time and manner of onset as johnston did a month before without the slightest reference to any possible initiative of mcclellan he had during the month allowed him by the inactivity of his opponent brought together from every available source a great army almost equal in numbers to the army of the potomac though there is a great disparity in the accounts of the different confederate officers who have written upon this subject there is no reason to doubt that the official estimate quoted with approval by general webb which states lee's force as eighty thousand seven hundred and sixty two is substantially correct webb says that mcclellan's effective force for the seven days battles was ninety two thousand five hundred considerably less than his own official report of the twentieth of june gives him which exclusive of dix's force was a hundred and five thousand four hundred and forty five the confederate forces were like the army opposed to them of the best material the country could furnish and no better men ever went to war in any age or region it is an unsolved and now an insolvable question whether the confederates had gained or lost by the wounding of johnston and the substitution of lee as the commander of their principal army they were both men of the best ability and highest character that the southern states could produce both trained soldiers of calm temper and great energy and both equally honorable and magnanimous in their treatment of their subordinates but general lee had a great advantage over his predecessor in possessing the perfect confidence and personal friendship of jefferson davis the head of the confederate government he was always sure in his enterprises of what johnston often lacked the sincere and zealous support of the richmond government he also enjoyed to an unusual degree the warm regard and esteem of those who were brought into personal or official relations with him his handsome and attractive presence his dignified yet cordial manner a certain sincerity and gentleness which was apparent in all his words and actions endeared him to his associates and made friends of strangers at first sight everything he asked for was given him he had been the favorite of general scott in the old army he became the favorite of mr davis in his new command the army which johnston gave up to him had been almost doubled in numbers by the time he considered himself ready to employ it against mcclellan lee's preparations were promptly and energetically made immediately after stuart's raid was completed he ordered stonewall jackson to join him by a letter of the sixteenth which gave minute instructions for his march and enjoined upon him the greatest secrecy and swiftness to mask this movement he ostentatiously sent jackson two brigades from richmond with drums beating and colors flying a proceeding which was promptly reported to mcclellan and caused him at first some perplexity but which he explained by his usual conclusion that lee had so overwhelming a force that a few brigades here or there made no difference to him the manoeuvre was of little practical account however as mcclellan was fully informed of jackson's approach in time to provide against it or to anticipate his arrival by taking the offensive he even knew as early as the twenty fifth that jackson was to come in on his right and rear but he made no use of this knowledge except to reproach the government for not sending him more troops 
jackson reported at richmond in person on the twenty third of june in advance of his corps and in a conference with longstreet and the two hills the plan of attacking the federal right wing north of the chickahominy was agreed upon as jackson's troops had the greatest distance to march it was left to him to say when the attack should be made he named the morning of the twenty sixth of june giving himself as it afterwards appeared too little time general lee matured his plan on the twenty fourth and issued his orders for the coming campaign the most striking thing about them is his evident contempt for his opponent he sent in effect full two-thirds of his army to the north side of the chickahominy to strike mcclellan's right wing the enemy is to be driven from mechanicsville the confederates are to sweep down the chickahominy and endeavor to drive the enemy from his position above new bridge general jackson bearing well to his left turning beaver dam creek and taking the direction towards cold harbor they will then press forward towards the york river railroad closing upon the enemy's rear and forcing him down the chickahominy any advance of the enemy towards richmond will be prevented by vigorously following his rear and crippling and arresting his progress he anticipated the possibility of mcclellan's abandoning his entrenchments on the south side of the river in which case he is to be closely pursued by huger and magruder cavalry were to occupy the roads to arrest his flight down the chickahominy general lee's plan and expectation was in short to herd and drive down the peninsula a magnificent army superior in numbers to his own and not inferior in any other respect if we accept the respective generals commanding who were at least equally distinguished engineers in this enterprise he deserved and courted defeat by leaving the bulk of mcclellan's army between himself and richmond when he laid his plan before jefferson davis the latter saw at once this serious defect in it he says i pointed out to him that our force and entrenched line between that left flank of the enemy and richmond was too weak for a protracted resistance and if mcclellan was the man i took him for as soon as he found that the bulk of our army was on the north side of the chickahominy he would not stop to try conclusions with it there but would immediately move upon his objective point the city of richmond if on the other hand he should behave like an engineer officer and deem it his first duty to protect his line of communication i thought the plan proposed was not only the best but would be a success something of his old esprit de corps manifested itself in general lee's first response that he did not know engineer officers were more likely than others to make such mistakes but immediately passing to the main subject he added if you will hold him as long as you can at the entrenchments and then fall back on the detached works around the city i will be upon the enemy's heels before he gets there but everything shows he anticipated no such action on the part of mcclellan all his orders all his dispositions indicate clearly that he thought of nothing but driving him down the chickahominy towards yorktown and capturing or dispersing his army the measure of success he met with will always be in the general judgment a justification of his plan but the opinion of the best military critics on both sides is that it never could have succeeded had it not been for mcclellan's hallucination as to the numbers opposed to him from the hour that lee crossed his troops over the chickahominy leaving that river and mcclellan's army between him and richmond he risked the fate of the confederacy upon his belief that the union general would make no forward movement his confidence grew with every step of mcclellan's retreat from beaver dam creek to malvern hill and was dearly paid for in the blood of his soldiers the first meeting between the two armies resulted in a terrible defeat for the confederates about three o'clock on the afternoon of the twenty sixth the rebel forces commanded by longstreet d h hill and a p hill attacked the union troops in position on the east side of beaver dam creek commanded by general mccall whose division had been added to fitz john porter's corps 
mccall's brigade commanders were truman seymour meade and john f reynolds of the last two the one gained an undying fame and the other a glorious death at gettysburg the confederates were in greatly superior force but the union troops had the advantage of position and though both sides fought with equal valor before night fell the rebels were repulsed with great slaughter general mcclellan visited fitz john porter's headquarters at night after the battle he found an exultant and victorious army almost unscathed by the fierce conflict of the day porter reports his loss at two hundred and fifty out of the five thousand engaged and says the enemy lost nearly two thousand of their ten thousand attacking if porter instead of mcclellan had been in command of the army richmond might have been under the union flag the next day his soldierly spirit flushed with the day's success comprehended the full advantage of the situation he urged mcclellan to seize his opportunity he proposed to hold his own at the beaver dam line slightly reinforced while general mcclellan moved the main body of the army upon richmond the general commanding had not resolution enough to accept or reject this proposition of his gallant subordinate he returned to his own headquarters to make up his mind and about three or four o'clock in the morning sent his final order to porter to retire to a position some four miles east behind boatswain swamp and there await the further attack of the enemy general porter's personal devotion to mcclellan which was afterwards to bring him into lifelong trouble has never allowed him to criticize this decision of his chief which overruled his own bold and intelligent plan let us see how the ablest and most efficient confederate general engaged in this campaign regarded it general longstreet says in my judgment the evacuation of beaver dam creek was very unwise on the part of the federal commanders we had attacked at beaver dam and had failed to make an impression at that point losing several thousand men and officers this demonstrated that the position was safe if the federal commanders knew of jackson's approach on the twenty sixth they had ample time to reinforce porter's right before friday morning twenty seventh with men and field defences to such extent as to make the remainder of the line to the right secure against assault so that the federals in withdrawing not only abandoned a strong position but gave up the morale of their success and transferred it to our somewhat disheartened forces for next to malvern hill the sacrifice at beaver dam was unequalled in demoralization during the entire summer it is hard to understand what general mcclellan means when he says in his report that the twenty sixth was the day upon which i had decided as the time for our final advance if he thought it safe to attack richmond with lee and his army in front of him how much more advantageous would such an attack have been with lee and two-thirds of his army engaged in a desperate battle north of the chickahominy there is no indication in his orders or dispatches of these days if we accept one order to porter hereafter to be mentioned that he had any more definite purpose than to await the action of the enemy and retreat to the james if necessary his mind was filled with the idea of an army of two hundred thousand under lee in his report written a year afterwards he reiterates and dwells upon this already disproved fiction basing his persistent belief on the reports of his detective service this is the only explanation possible of his action during this momentous week while he was flying from myriads which existed only in his own brain and his brave army was turning and checking lee's pursuing forces at every halt it made on the morning of the twenty seventh porter withdrew to his new position famous ever thereafter as the battlefield of gaines's mill or of the chickahominy as it is called by southern writers his ground like that of the day before was admirably chosen for defence he had less than one-third the number of the host which was marching by every road on the west and north to destroy him he knew his force was too small to defend so long a line against such numbers but his appeals to mcclellan for reinforcements brought no response until late in the day when slocum's division was sent him 
with the troops he had he made a magnificent fight which makes us speculate on what might have happened if he had commanded the entire army of the potomac on that day with the exception of the nine brigades left on the south side of the river under magruder and huger to hold mcclellan the whole army of general lee numbering over sixty thousand men was advancing upon porter's single corps it was led by the best generals of the south long street the two hills whiting hood ewell and the redoubtable jackson whose corps though marching with less than their usual celerity had turned beaver dam creek the night before and had now arrived at the post assigned them opposite porter's right general lee commanded on the field in person and jefferson davis contributed whatever his presence was worth the battle began at noon and as evening fell upon the desperately fought field the entire confederate army by a simultaneous advance forced back the union troops overcome by numbers and wearied with seven hours of constant fighting there was no confusion except at the point on the right where morrell's line had been pierced by hood's brigade where two regiments were made prisoner everywhere else the union soldiers retired fighting turning from time to time to beat back the enemy until night put an end to the conflict porter had lost four thousand in killed and wounded one-sixth of his men lee something more about one-twelfth of his the loss in missing was much larger on the union side than on the confederate lee had absolutely failed in his object to dislodge the union army from its position and drive it down the chickahominy of the heroic valor of this sanguinary day's work there can be no question there is much question of the wisdom of it if mcclellan had made up his mind to retreat to the james he might have withdrawn porter to the south side of the chickahominy during the night of the twenty sixth after his signal victory at beaver dam but as we have seen he gave no definite orders until three o'clock the next morning when he directed porter to retire to gaines's mill during all the terrible conflict of the twenty seventh he left his gallant subordinate to fight his force with no intimation of his ultimate purpose porter had a right to think that the price of his tremendous sacrifice was to be the capture of richmond mcclellan's orders to him on the twenty third included these words the troops on this side will be held ready either to support you directly or to attack the enemy in their front if the force attacking you is large the general would prefer the latter course counting upon your skill and the admirable troops under your command to hold their own against superior numbers long enough for him to make the decisive movement which will determine the fate of richmond in addition to this we have the most unimpeachable authority for saying that porter on the battlefield was left with the same impression general webb who was present with general porter during the fight ordered to that duty from mcclellan's headquarters says he carried with him to general porter the distinct impression then prevailing at the headquarters of the army that he was to hold this large force of the enemy on the left bank of the chickahominy in order that general mcclellan with the main army might break through and take richmond it was this inspiring thought which moved porter and his men to such a prodigious feat of arms general webb says the sacrifice of gaines's mill was warranted if we were to gain richmond by making it and the troops engaged in carrying out this plan conceiving it to be the wish of the general commanding were successful in holding the rebels on the left bank but the general commanding was incapable of the effort of will necessary to carry out his share of the plan he gives us to understand in his report and in subsequent articles that he resolved upon his retreat to the james on the twenty fifth of june general webb adopts this theory and adds that mcclellan thought that the capture of richmond with lee beyond the chickahominy was not a proper military movement it is not in the competence of any one to judge what were general mcclellan's thoughts and intentions from the twenty third to the twenty seventh of june so late as eight o'clock on the night of the twenty seventh a dispatch from him to the war department indicates that he thought the attack of magruder on the right bank was more serious than that upon porter on the left i may be forced he says to give up my position during the night but will not if it is possible to avoid it 
and as a matter of course the usual refrain follows had i twenty thousand fresh and good troops we would be sure of a splendid victory to-morrow magruder who had been left to guard richmond with only twenty five thousand troops had been all day repeating the devices which were so successful at yorktown he had rattled about mcclellan's entire front with so much noise and smoke as to create the impression of overwhelming numbers even the seasoned corps commanders were not unaffected by it franklin thought it not prudent to send any reinforcements from his line to porter sumner offered to send two brigades but thought it would be hazardous the real state of the case can best be seen from magruder's own report he says from friday night until sunday morning i considered the situation of our army as extremely critical and perilous the larger portion of it was on the opposite side of the chickahominy the bridges had been all destroyed but one was rebuilt the new bridge which was commanded fully by the enemy's guns from goldings and there were but twenty five thousand men between his army of one hundred thousand and richmond had mcclellan massed his whole force in column and advanced it against any point of our line of battle as was done at austerlitz under similar circumstances by the greatest captain of any age though the head of his column would have suffered greatly its momentum would have ensured him success and the occupation of our works about richmond and consequently the city might have been his reward his failure to do so is the best evidence that our wise commander fully understood the character of his opponent d h hill says the same thing during lee's absence richmond was at the mercy of mcclellan the fortifications around richmond at that time were very slight mcclellan could have captured the city with very little loss of life the want of supplies would have forced lee to attack him as soon as possible with all the disadvantages of a precipitated movement general mcclellan did not visit the field of battle during the day at night he summoned porter across the river and there made known to him and the other corps commanders for the first time his intention to change his base to the james porter was ordered to retire to the south bank and destroy the bridges after him this was accomplished safely and in good order and the bridges were destroyed soon after sunrise on the twenty eighth the movement to the james once resolved upon it was executed with great energy and ability general keyes moved his corps with artillery and baggage across the white oak swamp and possessed himself of the ground on the other side for the covering of the passage of the other troops and the trains by noon of the twenty eighth general porter's corps during the same day and night crossed the white oak swamp and established itself in positions that covered the roads from richmond franklin withdrew from the extreme right after a skirmish at golding's farm keyes and porter continued in the advance and established their two corps safely at malvern hill thus securing the extreme left flank of the army in a commanding and important situation this movement took general lee completely by surprise anticipating nothing but a retreat down the chickahominy he had thrown his left wing and his entire cavalry force in that direction when he became aware of his mistake a good deal of precious time was already lost and he was deprived during the three days that followed of stuart's invaluable services but on the twenty ninth having ascertained that mcclellan was marching to the james he immediately started in pursuit sending his whole force by parallel roads to intercept the army of the potomac near charles city crossroads midway between the white oak swamp and the james longstreet was to march with a p hill by the long bridge road while huger was to come up at the same time by the charles city road and general holmes was to take up position below him on the river road jackson crossing the grapevine bridge was to come in from the north on the rear of the federal army even the terrible lessons of beaver dam and gaines's mill had not convinced general lee of the danger of attacking the army of the potomac in position these lessons were repeated all along the line of march sumner repulsed magruder at allen's farm and then retiring to savage's station he and franklin met another fierce onslaught from the same force and completely defeated them it was with the greatest difficulty that franklin could induce the gallant old general to leave the field 
mcclellan's orders were positive that the white oak swamp must be crossed that night but to all franklin's representations sumner answered no general you shall not go nor will i when shown mcclellan's positive orders he cried out mcclellan did not know the circumstances when he wrote that note he did not know that we would fight a battle and gain a victory he only gave way and reluctantly took up his line of march for the southward on the positive orders of an aide-de-camp who had just left mcclellan the next day occurred the battle of glendale or fraser's farm as it is sometimes called jackson with unusual slowness had arrived at savage's station the day before too late to take part in the battle there and when he came to white oak swamp the bridge was gone and franklin occupied the heights beyond his force was therefore neutralized during the day he made once or twice a feeble attempt to cross the swamp but was promptly met and driven back by franklin huger on the charles city road failed to break through some slight obstruction there holmes was in terror of the gunboats near malvern hill and could give no assistance so that longstreet and a p hill were forced to attack the union center at glendale on pretty nearly even terms here a savage and obstinate conflict took place which was felt on both sides to be the crisis of the campaign if the union centre had been pierced the disaster would have been beyond calculation on the other hand if our army had been concentrated at that point and had defeated the army of lee the city of richmond would have been the prize of victory general franklin says that the prince de joinville who was at that moment taking leave of the army to return to europe said to him with great earnestness advise general mcclellan to centre his army at this point and fight the battle to-day if he does he will be in richmond to-morrow neither side won the victory that day though each deserved it by brave and persistent fighting general mcclellan intent upon searching for a defensive position for his army upon the james left the field before the conflict began while longstreet lee and jefferson davis himself were under the fire of the union guns during the afternoon when darkness put an end to the fighting the federal generals left to their discretion had accomplished their purpose the enemy had been held in check the trains and artillery had gone safely forward by the road which the battle had protected and on the next morning july one the army of the potomac was awaiting its enemy in the natural fortress of malvern hill it was at this place that general lee's contempt for his enemy was to meet its last and severest chastisement the position strikingly resembled the battlefield of gaines's mill the union army was posted on a high position in lines selected and established by general humphreys covered on the right and on the left by swampy streams and winding ravines woods in front furnished a cover for the formation of the confederate columns but an open space intervening afforded full play for the terrible federal artillery it was not the place for a prudent general to attack and lee was usually one of the most prudent of generals but he had his whole army well in hand jackson having come up in the night and he decided to risk the venture d h hill took the liberty of representing the great strength of mcclellan's position and to give his opinion against an assault longstreet who was present laughed and said don't get scared now that we have got him whipped it was this belief in the demoralization of the federal army hill says that made our leader risk the attack lee evidently thought the position could be carried by a coup de main the order to his generals of division is a curiosity of military literature batteries have been established to rake the enemy's line if it is broken as is probable armistead who can witness the effect of the fire has been ordered to charge with a yell do the same on the part of the confederates the battle was as ill executed as it was ill conceived there was a vast amount of blood and valor wasted by them while on the union side under the admirable leadership of porter morell and couch not a drop of blood nor an ounce of powder was thrown away successive attacks made by the confederates from one o'clock until nine were promptly and bravely repulsed by the union soldiers jackson's forces suffered severely in getting into position early in the afternoon one of huger's brigades charged upon couch about three o'clock and was driven back roughly handled 
d h hill waited a long time for the yell from armistead which was to be his signal for onset but armistead's yell in that roar of artillery was but a feeble pipe and was soon silenced and when hill at last heard some shouting on his right and concluded to advance he was repulsed and fearfully punished by the immovable brigades of couch and heitzelman the most picturesque perhaps we may say the most sensational charge of the day was that made by magruder late in the afternoon his nine brigades melted away like men of snow under the frightful fire of sykes's batteries and the muskets of morell's steadfast infantry this charge closed the fighting for the day the union line had not been broken one remarkable feature of the battle of malvern hill was that neither of the generals commanding exercised any definite control over the progress of the fight general lee it is true was on the field accompanied by jefferson davis but with the exception of that preposterous order about armistead's yell he seems to have allowed his corps commanders to fight the battle in their own way their reports are filled with angry recriminations and show a gross lack of discipline and organization early in the afternoon lee ordered longstreet and hill to move their forces by the left flank intending to cut off the expected retreat of mcclellan longstreet says i issued my orders accordingly for the two division commanders to go around and turn the federal right when in some way unknown to me the battle was drawn on we were repulsed at all points with fearful slaughter losing six thousand men and accomplishing nothing general mcclellan left the field in the morning before the fighting began and went to his camp at hexall's which was under the protection of the gunboats he came back for a little while in the afternoon but remained with the right wing where there was no fighting he said his anxiety was for the right wing as he was perfectly sure of the left and the centre in this way he deprived himself of the pleasure of witnessing a great victory won by the troops under the command of his subordinate generals it is not impossible that if he had seen with his own eyes the magnificent success of the union arms during the day he would have held the ground which had been so gallantly defended to judge from the accounts of the officers on both sides nothing would have been easier the defeat and consequent demoralization of the confederate forces surpassed anything seen in the war and it might have been completed by a vigorous offensive on the morning of the second even major dabney of jackson's staff whose sturdy partisanship usually refuses to recognize the plainest facts unfavorable to his side gives this picture of the feeling of the division commanders of jackson's corps the night of the battle after many details of losses and disasters they all concurred in declaring that mcclellan would probably take the aggressive in the morning and that the confederate army was in no condition to resist him but impressed by the phantasm of two hundred thousand men before him mcclellan had already resolved to retire still farther down the james to harrison's landing in order as he says to reach a point where his supplies could be brought to him with certainty commodore rogers with whom he was in constant consultation thought this could best be done below city point the victorious army therefore following the habit of the disastrous week turned its back once more upon its beaten enemy and established itself that day at harrison's bar in a situation which lee having at last gained some information as to the fighting qualities of the army of the potomac declined to attack a decision in which jackson half of whose men were out of their ranks by death wounds or straggling agreed with him after several days of reconnaissance he withdrew his army on the eighth of july to richmond and the peninsular campaign was at an end, end of chapter twenty three